presenter up. I can get to my schedule here. Um, is Dylan, and he's going to be presenting on an independent study of psychology in relation to individuals on the autism spectrum. Researching how psychology relates to individuals on the autism spectrum. Research I have gathered, including understanding autism spectrum disorder, why cases are increasing, diagnosing an individual with ASD or autism spectrum disorder, and what forms of treatment are, and support are in place. I would also be expect, um, explaining my experiences at Ben Haven, so some background, research gathered, memorable moments, teaching examples, and also my experience at Chapel Haven, some background, research gathered, recap gathering, recap gathering memorable moments. As I begin to search for possible career choices for my future, I struggled. I've always had an interest in the sciences, but where exactly would I best fit constantly became a roadblock for me. Eventually, I narrowed it down and decided a capstone would be, best, would be the perfect opportunity for me to test my interest in psychology and autism development. On top of that, I plan to test that interest, develop the great, a greater understanding for a field of study I'm passionate about, gain first-hand experience with individuals on the autism spectrum, and learn what is being done and what steps can be taken to improve the lives of individuals on the autism spectrum. One important factor before researching autism development is to first have an understanding of how psychology relates to individuals on the autism spectrum. Psychologists play an important role in diagnosing, researching, and helping families understand what challenges they are to face when raising an individual on the autism spectrum. On top of that, when researching autism development, I discovered how important it is for one to have a general understanding of psychology and statistics when it comes to interpreting data found by research and fieldwork. The autism spectrum exists along what is called a spectrum or continuum. Some individuals on the autism spectrum are able to go to school, work a job, and perform daily living functions with limited support. However, the, this diverse disorder leaves some individuals on the autism spectrum with severe intellect, intellectual impairments that will require support and assistance throughout their lives. As you can see in the diagram, it goes from high functioning autism, which is a level one, autism, which is a level two, and severe autism, which is a level three. ASD, or autism spectrum disorder, can be recognized in individuals through characteristics such as repetitive behaviors and difficulties with social interaction. Below I have listed some common signs and symptoms of ASD. So failure to make eye contact beginning in infancy, failure to respond to one's own name, unusual movements such as rocking, twirling, or flapping arms, difficulty understanding tone of voice, body language, and gestures, and difficulty breaking from a routine. Even though research tends to demonstrate an upward curve of ASD cases over the years, shown in this graph on the right, it is important to understand the reason behind this belief. As discussed in the book, Autism and Pervasive Development Disorders, edited by Fred Volkmar, it is important to understand the difference between prevalence and incidence. When compiling casual research, only incidence rates can be used. However, as both prevalence and incident rates are being improved, their rates will continue to increase. As also talked about in the book, the epidemic hypothesis that emerged in the 1990s is one of the many examples of this. The book explains, in most countries, increasing numbers were diagnosed with ASDs, leading to an upward trend in children registered in service provider databases that was paralleled by higher referral rates to clinical service and prevalence rates in epidemiological service. These trends were interpreted as evidence that the actual population incidence of ASDs was increasing. However, because methodological factors contribute to variability in prevalence estimates, these must be considered before concluding that there is true rise in the incident cases of ASD in the population. The graph on the right demonstrates the sort of effect. So estimates that rely purely on service, so these uh, hollow dots from one to time two, rather than estimates based on population prevalence, so these solids right here, create the effect of rising prevalence over time. So from time one, you can see how it increased at time two. Diagnosing an individual with ASD. The age of diagnosing can range from as young as 50 months of age to adulthood. It is important, however, that an individual receives a diagnosis at a young age because early diagnosis allows for early intervention. I'll go into more detail in a few slides on a proven th therapy that supports this statement. 
ASD is a neurodevelopmental disorder and has evidence pointing towards it being a genetic-based disorder. However, research is still inconclusive. Scientists have discovered recently that autism has occurred more frequently among individuals with certain medical conditions that have genetic causes. Conditions such as fragile X syndrome, tuberosis sclerosis, congenital rubella syndrome, and phenylketonuria, or PKU. Are just to name a few. An individual with ASD cannot be diagnosed with medical tests such as blood tests and brain scans. This is where experts such as psychologists, pediatricians, and neurolo neurologi ne neurologists, neurologists are required to diagnose the condition of an individual based on the patient's history and behaviors. It is imperative, however, for an diagnosing the patient to have an extensive background and experience with a wide range of symptoms associated with ASD. Before the expert makes the diagnosis of ASD, they must first gather information. Patient interviews are, some of the, are one of the um, pieces of information gathered. Observations of patient behaviors, tests of cognitive and language abilities, medical tests to rule out other conditions, interviews with parents, teacher, or adults who can answer questions about the patient's social, emotional, and development. So referring back to this previous statement I made on the important, importance of diagnosing individuals with at a young age, the Early Start Denver model is an example of a therapy that has proven to yield results in children who show symptoms of autism. The purpose of ESDM is to promote social and communication skills and learning between the ages of 12 and 48 months. Before ESDM can begin, however, it is essential for therapy to begin the moment autism symptoms emerge. The purpose behind this is to ensure some effective intervention policies for children with autism. This includes various things such as insurance coverage and state support for early autism intervention. ESDM is originally based on methods utilizing an ABA, which is the type of therapy that focuses on improving specific behaviors such as social skills, communication, reading, etc., as well as adaptive learning skills, such as fine motor dexterity, hygiene, etc. <clears throat> what makes ESDM different, however, is its utilization of play and joint activities, which allow for the patient to feel encouraged, promoting language, social, and cognitive skills. So what sort of strategies does ESDM use? ESDM focuses on building positive relationships, teaching during natural play times and everyday activities, and encouraging interaction and communication during these play times. U using USDM holds many benefits. For example, the flexibility to perform the therapy at school, clinics, or at home in both group and one-on-one -on -one settings. The involvement of fam family and signs of the child benefit benefiting from the therapy, regardless of what sort of learning challenges each one faces. One of the most important benefits, however, is that studies have shown years later, after the therapy has concluded, that the patient is still able to maintain a gain in overall intellectual ability and language. On top of that, some patients showed areas of progress in reducing autism symptoms. ESDM is not the only form of treatment and support. Several forms of interventions have been developed over the years to develop to help treat individuals with ASD. As mentioned before, ABA, or Applied Behavior Analysis, is a popular method that uses evidence-based techniques to increase helpful behavior and reduce harmful ones that can have an impact on their learning process. ABA has shown to improve communication, social, and vocational skills. A form of treatment is known as the DIR model, also known as the floor time therapy. DIR consists of and therapists playing the child's lead and playing together whilst also directing the child to engage in increasingly complex interactions. Finally, the Teach Autism program works to promote engagement in activities, flexibility, independence, and self-efficacy through strategies based on this learning strengths and difficulties of people with ASD. Excuse me. <clears throat> now putting independent research behind, I would like to talk to you all about my field work or volunteer service. Ben Haven is one of the two places I volunteered at over the course of this year-long capstone. Ben Haven was founded in 1963 by Amy, Amy Ledick as a school for children with autism. Over the years, Ben Haven has grown into a multi-phase facility that serves people of all with diverse needs. 
nonprofit organization with four program areas, Ben Haven School and Residential Service, the Ben Haven Learning Network, and Ben Haven Indi Individual and Family Support Program. I worked in the Rosenberg Center alongside North Haven volunteers, Danny, the head of the Rosenberg Center, and Stu, a full-time worker at the center. Ben Haven is made on the border of North Haven and North Brantford and houses five adult patients with ASD. So, patient one is one, as my research, it was extremely important for me to keep names of each, pair, each patient confidential. Researching, I each patient a number. Below, I've listed each patient's number, the teaching strategies for each, and some distinct features I noted about each patient. Over the year, each volunteer was assigned a specific patient to work with. Mine was patient one. However, in, mo in, in the first two weeks of working at Ben Haven, I was able to work with every patient at least once to gather information. So patient one. Oops. Teaching strategies I use with patient one. Matching. So I would lay out an image of very, I would lay out images of various nouns, verbs, and the patient would take the, uh, uh, the, the word that I would give him, and he would match the word to the image that I have laid out. Counting and writing number practice was, and I would lay out numbers of, uh, different numbers of the bills, and the patient would count the dollar bills and write the number on a piece of paper. Only another teacher I used was retrieval. So I would name different objects on a list around the center, and the patient walks around to point them out to me with an attempt to repeat the name of the object when found. Some distinct features that I found about patient one is that he's very calm and laid back. He's very intelligent and quick to bring him into action. He cannot speak that well. However, patient one is always around the volunteer, always around the volunteers at the center, humming a lovely tune. After completing a matching session, patient one stacks the cards up and extends his hands for low five. Patient two, some teaching strategies. The main teaching strategy I used with patient two was sign language. To perform this task, I was to read aloud a word on the list and the patient was to repeat that word in the form of sign language. With every correct answer, a high five was exchanged. Some distinct features I found with patient two is that he would tend to clatter his teeth frequently. When excited about something, patient two would begin to hum. Patient two also rarely showed any signs of anger during my time spent with him and was an extremely good listener. Patient three. So similar to patient one, patient three would go about, but this time it was includes sign language. So a word and he signs the word, places the word on an image that I laid on the table and repeats the sign again. Some features I found with patient three is that he's very common most of the time. Patient three attempts to be very mature and proper with his actions. From time to time, patient three demonstrates true behavior without his findings. When patient answer, he becomes very aggravated. Patient four. Patient four utilizes translation. So I would show him a phrase in English, and then he would repeat back to me that phrase in Spanish. Some distinct features I found with patient four is that he has an amazing memory. When you first meet him, he will ask you for your name, the name of each member of your family. Next time he sees you, he challenges himself in repeating your name and your family's names. Patient four is also able to tell you the exact day of the week, for example, your birthday, and tell you what exact day of the week it is. When having a conversation with patient four, he would randomly clap his wrists together, either to show he does not know an answer or something is troubling him. Patient five. So some teaching strategies I used with patient five was fill in the blank. So I would lay out a phrase with the blank and three possible options to fill the blanks that makes the most sense. Patient five will choose an option and read out the complete phrase. Patient five also practices with sign language. I would read out a word on a list and she repeats the word back to me in sign language. Distinct features of patient five. Patient five is known as the queen of Rosenberg Center. She is very particular in her placements of and neatness of objects. If she sees something out of place, she will instantly correct it. With an excellent memory, patient five is always quick and precise during her sign language practice. I would like to talk about a memorable moment that I had at Ben Haven. So go fish with patient four. At the end of each session, the volunteers will meet up at patient's four room to have a recap session on the work we did, was playing go fish with a deck of playing cards. 
Go Fish is patient for his favorite game and looks forward to playing it every time he sees us. During our game, Patient 4 will randomly throw in an incorrect question, such as, has three legs? Wait for you to respond with a, a bet has four legs. Although these meetings never last in more than 10 minutes, it was extremely valuable for me to see others that take time out of their day to help a group of people they feel extremely passionate towards. Before I move on to my final volunteering experience, I would like to teach a little bit of sign language. So if everyone can see me well, the first word or words that I picked up along the way are very simple words. They're almost straight word. So the first word, dog. You would take two hands, and you can't see me now, but you would put them on your thighs, like a dog is about to jump up on your thigh, and that would be dog in sign language. Shave is you would make the shape with your hand and pretend like you're shaving. It's straightforward. An apron, for example, you would pretend like you're putting on an apron, and that would be apron. Finally, I incorporated this um, alphabet of sign language to demonstrate how a lot of sign language uses the list and then complements them with actions. For example, Y right here. And if you put Y up to your mouth, that means you want some yogurt. Recycling is a very commonly used word at Ben Haven. So you would make your fingers in the shape of an R and then pretend like you're making the recycling symbol. So, Chapel Haven was the second place I volunteered at over the course of my year-long capstone. Thanks to Gina Apicella, the Vice President of Autism Service, I was able to receive a detailed background on Chapel Haven and what sort of work they do for individuals on the autism spectrum. Chapel Haven was founded in 1972 by a group of six families. The families had children who went to school, graduated, learned skills, but did not know what to do with, the, did not know what to do with those skills. At first, Chapel Haven was called Maple Brook School and had six students, two staff, and one dog. The main purpose of this school was to teach these students independent living skills. In 18, 1976, the school moved to where Chapel Haven currently is to start up what is called the REACH program, a program geared more towards individuals with intellectual disabilities. In 2006, this program became known as the ASAT, or Asperger's Syndrome Adult Transition. This is the program where Ms. which Miss Apicella was overlooking. In this program, individuals that were high functioning but autism spectrum. Dr. Volkmar, in fact, was a major contributor in writing the curriculum. ASAT is a two year long residential program at Chapel Haven campus with the main goal of minimizing the support given to the students. Some students will also need, always need some sort of support, for example, paying bills. There are four main domains that it covers, social communication, independent living skills, self-determination, and post-secondary vocation and education, which includes exploring majors, programs, colleges, or even getting a job. Even though some students already have college degrees, they are entered into the program because they cannot live independently. Students can take classes every day from 9 till 3, with even some, 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 even some evening classes. The main focus of ASAT are to help students develop generalizing skills, problem-solving techniques, trial and error practice, and building confidence. <clears throat> ASAT also gives the option for students to live on campus. It's not required, but highly encouraged, since it gives the experience of independent living with faculty and aid if the student needs it. One of the main skills taught throughout this program is time management and scheduling skills. To help develop this skill, Students start with small jobs, such as working in retail, food banks, and helping, off with, helping with office tasks. One of the most common problems that Ms. Apicella explained to me is that students over time begin to develop a dependence on their peers, parents, and teachers. That is why it's important for students to live independently and develop the main focuses of ASAT. By completing daily tasks, such as grocery shopping and traveling to the laundromat to do their laundry, students begin to develop independent living skills. <clears throat> once a student is ready to move on, once a student is ready, they can move on to the CISO program or the Center for Employment Service Opportunities, where they can find internships or a mentor for vocational study. When a student becomes ready for a CISO, they can move out of Chapel Haven. However, typically a student will rent out an apartment in a one mile radius of Chapel Haven so they can receive aid from an advisor if necessary. 
Ms. Apicella explained to me how she began to notice the pros and cons of students using technology. Some pros of tech using technology for individuals with ASD was that social media helps with their social anxiety. Certain chat sites, video games, also help students gain a sense of composure. Using this techno technology has been shown to help students with their social skills immensely. A major con to all of this, however, is a student can easily become addicted. If a student becomes an unable to put aside their technology, they begin to lose focus of the program. Some students have even been known to be sent home because of this problem. Through my work with Chapel Haven, I was always able to gain first-hand experience of what life is like for residents living on campus. Alongside staff member Jason, I gained some first-hand knowledge on what, it, on what the program looks like. Similar to Ben Haven, Chapel Haven makes it clear to volunteers that names are confidential, so I will use patient one when talking about the individual I worked with. Every Tuesday evening, I met with patient one. Patient one lives with another student in an apartment complex on campus. Once I arrive at the apartment in the evening, Jason and I go through a list of daily chores for patient one and his roommate. These chores can consist of doing the dishes, making sure their rooms and bathrooms are clean, keeping track of how much food they have stored, what they had for dinner, etc. After going through the checklist, Jason leaves the apartment, allowing me to spend interacting time with patient one. Patient one is a very calm, gentle, and intellectual individual who, shows, who follows tasks without complaint. Each time I meet with patient one, our conversations vary. However, over the course of the first month working with patient one, I began to learn about his life and interests. <clears throat> one of patient one's many interests he shared with me was his interest in old fashioned magazines and even allowed me to look through them with him, showing he is comfortable with social interaction and demonstrates generosity. Patient one is also attending college. So some nights when patient one had a lot of extra homework, I would spend our time together helping him or just plain observing. Patient one proved to have some high functioning skills, such as reading, writing, and critical thinking, which demonstrated to me as he completed his homework. <clears throat> After meeting with patient one and going through a checklist of tasks, Jason, everyone in the apartment complex, so around eight to 10 people, would meet up for a time known as recap gathering. To start off each meeting, Jason would ask each individual what their ups and downs of the day were. At times, the students would begin to go off topic and take control of the conversation. However, Jason would direct the conversation back to its mouth. Once each individual had their turn, Jason would ask if anyone had any current events they would like to share. During this time especially, I was able to understand each individual's interest and observe how respectful everyone was by listening and adding onto the conversation at the appropriate times. Discussing current events allow me to see how each individual is able to utilize technology in a positive way that helps further grow their knowledge of the world and society around them. Once everyone has a chance to share, the meeting became a time for everyone to speak their minds and interact with each other. <clears throat> so a memorable experience for me during the recap gathering. One night at the recap gathering, the topic of global warming erupted. I was instantly impressed at how capable each and every individual was at maintaining the topic of conversation and being patient with each other. Not only was each individual able to speak their opinion on the subject, but back it up with statements and facts such as ice cap reducing by 20%, using scientific terms such as CO2 emission, and relating it all to capitalism. This moment not only opened my eyes to the future possibility of our society can have for these individuals, but what sort of opportunities we should be giving each and every one of them. Some ending notes. With countless experiences made and knowledge gathered, I can safely say that this capstone journey was the right decision. The unfortunate circumstance of coronavirus cut short my time at each organization. However, I developed not only a greater understanding of the field, but countless memories that I will take with me for the rest of my life. With the opportunity given by my mentor, I plan to continue this capstone as an internship so I can continue to see if the topic of this, cap of this capstone is truly a career to pursue. Some citations. And I would like to make a special thanks and recognize Dr. Fred Volkmar for all the work he has done for me. I would not have been able to accomplish any of this without him. Thank you. Nice job, Dylan. What an amazing experience you had at both places. It's incredible. 
And did I hear you say that you're going to be doing an internship next year? That is the plan. Um, coronavirus is really killing us all, but it, it's hopefully a plan uh, over the summer and even in the fall to do some online internships and see what happens. That's excellent. Well, I mean, the experiences that you've had up until the quarantine have just been absolutely incredible. Um, really, really impressive. Can Thank you. you. Um, in terms of gaining, because you had a lot of in-depth conversations with the patients, was there anything you did in particular that helped you gain rapport with them for them to be comfortable speaking to you and answering questions and working with them? Well, for patient one, I've been even, um, with him the most. So I became very comfortable and certain things like me being a singer for example, um, instantly clicked with me and him because patient one tended to hum most of the time. And also some slight things that not everyone would pick up on, but after completing a task with patient one, I would give him a high five. And this high five will show that he has accomplished something and that he can be comfortable around me. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, it definitely worked because it's clear that you did, and he did feel that way. Um, let's see, a few comments here um, from Cheryl at Mrs. Robertson. From Hi, Ms. Robertson. Yep. Uh, this was fantastic. This was fascinating, and I'm so glad that you had this rewarding experience. I'm so proud of you. The patients are so fortunate to have had them in your lives. Me too. It was truly just an, an experience that I will remember for a long, long time. And I think um, your mentor is, is raising his hand. He's looking to talk. I'm going to see if I could, um, on the Zoom call, if I could allow him to talk if he wants to ask a question. I'm not sure if this will work, but I'm going to try. If you can hear me, Dr. Volkmar, um, you can put any comments or questions in the chat um, if there's anything that you'd like to see. I saw that you raised your hand a couple times, so that's why I, oh, he said, great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So is there anything in particular that you'll, you think you'll focus on when you move into the internship? Because it seems like you learned a lot of different pieces um, to all of the experiences. Is there anything in particular that you want to focus on? Um, I kind of want to stay in a, a relative field of study. Um, it's not exactly 100% sure what exactly um, Dr. Volkmar has in mind for me, but I, I do hope to stay in the same field, of course, because it, it's just a continuation of this capstone, and uh, I already have a, a background of it, so it would be just easy, easy for me to just jump right back in and, and enjoy the experience. Awesome. Well, that sounds great. Um, good job. I know that um, from the beginning of this capstone project, you have and I'm happy to see it all come through. Me too. All right. Well, that concludes our presentations for this evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Nice job, Dylan. Um, and for those of you who are listening, we have some more presentations tomorrow evening, and I hope that anyone that's here can join again tomorrow.